Lynn Jones Moog was born June 29, 1986, and was described as a kind, beloved teacher and an amazing mother. She is a native of Erie, Pennsylvania, and graduated General McLean High School. She then went on to graduate from Middle Tennessee State University with a degree in teaching. At the age of 18, she met Tyler Moog in Pennsylvania, and the two quickly married in 2004 when she became pregnant. The couple moved to Tennessee to live near his family and had a daughter named Liliana and called her Lily. In 2009, after six years of a rough marriage for Shelley, the couple divorced. Shelley moved into an apartment in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and began working as an eighth grade teacher at Harris Middle High School. Tyler remained in Shelbyville, living on Old Nashville Dirt Road, where the couple had lived. Tyler is described as violent and angry and was once arrested after he allegedly tried to run her vehicle off the road. He was also suspected of vandalizing her home twice, although no charges were filed in those incidents. Soon after, Shelley would go missing. She was last seen on February 28, 2011, after she arrived at his home to drop their daughter off as they had shared custody at the time. He later stated she was upset when she went inside his house and said she thought her new boyfriend was being unfaithful. He said Shelly stayed at his home for about an hour and then left to run some errands, promising to return before 10 p.m. She was supposed to meet a maintenance worker at her new apartment at 4.30 p.m., but she never arrived. At 12.30 a.m. the next morning, her white Pontiac Grand Prix was found abandoned and burned in an empty farm field off US 41A, southeast of Murfreesboro, roughly 30 miles from where Tyler lived. It wasn't until Tyler reported her missing a few days later that police realized the vehicle belonged to 24-year-old Shelley. Authorities determined the cause of the fire was arson using gasoline as an accelerant. Unfortunately, the fire destroyed whatever clues might have been there, but no signs of human remains were found. Shelley had the day off of work on March 1st, the day after she was last seen, which is part of the reason no one immediately realized she was missing. But when she didn't show up for work the next day after that, everyone became concerned. It would eventually be determined that the burned car was Shelley's. Once cops cleared the maintenance man that she was scheduled to meet and her new boyfriend, they shifted their focus back on her ex-husband. It turns out that he had been abusive and even cruel to Shelley during their marriage and was angry that she had begun dating another man. After Shelley's disappearance, her parents got in a custody battle with Tyler over the couple's daughter. Witnesses testified that Tyler used and sold illicit drugs and was violent and that he verbally and physically abused Shelley. In a court deposition for the custody case, Tyler refused to answer most questions about the day of Shelley's disappearance and pleaded the fifth over 150 times. On advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer on the grounds of the Fifth Amendment. A specialist in forensic interviews with children asked Lily about the day her mom disappeared. Lily said they went to Tyler's home and she stayed in the car while her mother went to the door. Lily stated that later her dad took her out of the car seat and took her to a bedroom and closed the door and told her not to come out. She never actually saw her mother again after she got out of the car. Shelley's relatives were eventually given custody of Lily as the court thought Tyler was an unfit parent due to his drug activity and history of domestic violence. Tyler's family appealed this decision but lost. According to public court records, his prior criminal convictions include reckless endangerment, theft of property, and alteration of serial numbers, and several witnesses testified about his verbal and physical abuse towards Shelley. Ten days after she went missing, detectives found surveillance video from a convenience store a few miles from Tyler's home. It shows him the morning after her disappearance pulling up in his truck to the dumpster where he remained for five to ten minutes. Investigators in the custody case found another revelation involving Lily. They found out that Tyler had been talking to his daughter about burning down his ex-mother-in-law's home. He wanted to give her matches so she could help burn down her house. Thankfully, Shelley's family won custody of Lily, preventing her from being subjected to any more of that abuse. 
After Shelley's disappearance, he pocket dialed 911 and a 22 minute conversation was recorded between him and his father while working without him realizing it. Some of the conversation with his father is garbled and difficult to hear, but Tyler seems to be talking about the night Shelley disappeared and how he was innocent and other things related to the case. Part of the 911 call can be heard on YouTube under Tyler Mook's accidental call to 911. Minutes later, he calls 911 back and asks if they got a call from his number earlier and if they record stuff like that. Some people speculate that the call wasn't an accident, but instead was actually on purpose to make himself look innocent. Tyler moved to Palm City, Florida shortly after the 911 call, looking to start a new life. In October 2014, over three years after his ex-wife went missing, Tyler attacked his girlfriend Robin on his speedboat and threw her into the water and tried to hold her under. Robin says she didn't know anything about Tyler Mook's past in Tennessee, and for a while, she didn't even know his real name because he had told her it was Cook. She says she saw Mook racing on the side of his boat and asked what it meant. He told her that was his last name and that he had been joking when he told her it was Cook. She then searched for him online and found out about his past. She talked to her mother, who told her to get away from him. She told him what she learned and he charmed her into believing it wasn't true and they remained together. One day, Robin and Tyler, along with his brother Andrew and his girlfriend Nicole, went out for a cruise on his speedboat. He first became angry at her for being late and then spent the day drinking. He was speeding so much that she became scared and kept yelling at him to slow down. She again tried to get him to slow down when speeding through a no-wake zone. He eventually shut the motor off, threw her cell phone, and threw her over the boat into the water. He then jumped in and held her under the water. She managed to come up for air a couple times, but he kept holding her underwater. When she managed to get up for air at one point, she yelled for Tyler's brother to help. His brother jumped in and put Tyler in a chokehold, and meanwhile another boat arrived and she begged them to get her out of the water, stating that he just tried to kill her. He fled the scene after saying, no one disrespects me in front of my family and I will kill her. The second boat took her to shore and she reported the incident to police. He was then arrested that night, but his mom quickly bailed him out. Robin then got a restraining order against him. Days after the incident on the boat, detectives from Tennessee came to Florida and met with Robin. The battery charges against Tyler were escalated to attempted murder in the first degree. During trial, Tyler's brother testified despite his family trying to prevent him from doing so. He said at the end of the day, he loves his brother, but he had to tell the truth and describe the same scenario that Robin described. His defense argued he had simply lost his temper and had not intended to kill his girlfriend. The jury's verdict was guilty on the lesser charge of attempted second degree murder. Tyler was sentenced to 12 years in prison. During the trial, Shelley's mother was there for Robin. He remains a person of interest in Shelley's case, but since there is no body or crime scene, investigators have had a difficult time being able to charge him with her alleged murder. Investigators do not believe that he acted alone, as he would have needed help disposing of the car and getting back home while having his daughter. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation later searched a van owned by Tyler's neighbor, but wouldn't say what led them to the neighbor's van or how it might be connected. Shelley has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Marlena Danielle Childress was born February 17, 1983, to Pamela and Kevin. Her parents would eventually divorce, and in 1987, four-year-old Marlena lived in Union City, Tennessee with her mother, Pam Bailey, her stepfather, Johnny Bailey, and four-month-old half-brother, Damon. On April 16, 1987, Pam had taken Marlena and her stepson, Jerry, to a nearby store to buy candy. While they were there, Jerry and the store owner recalled seeing a man speaking to Marlena while standing outside a red car with a McCracken County, Kentucky license plate. Then about 3 p.m., Marlena was playing in the yard of her home and her mother stated she heard a car slam on the brakes and when she looked out of the window, she claimed to see the same two-door older red car speeding away with the McCracken County, Kentucky license plate. 
She said when she went to check on Marlena, she was gone and then reported her missing. The man that was seen talking to Marlena earlier in the afternoon at the nearby store was soon tracked down but was ruled out as a suspect. This put Bailey's claims into question. Marlena's biological father and her stepfather were also cleared of any involvement. Bailey then checked herself into a local hospital for several days complaining of exhaustion. Two months after Marlena's disappearance, her mother told investigators that she had hit Marlena while trying to discipline her and had unintentionally killed her. She told a private investigator hired by Bailey's family that Marlena was misbehaving, so she turned around and slapped her so hard that she fell over and hit her head on a table. She said she then placed Marlena's body in her truck and drove to the nearby town of Martin. She also said that she phoned a family friend named P.L. Summers for assistance and he met her at a bridge on Campground Road where they both proceeded to throw her body into the North Fork of the Obion River. Even though a search of the river turned up no trace of Marlena, a bone and a stained cloth were found about four miles downstream from where Pam claimed to have dumped the body. These items were then sent to Nashville for testing, but it's unclear what the results were. Pam was ultimately charged with second-degree murder. When Summers was questioned by police, he denied any involvement, saying he knew Bailey but hadn't even seen her in two years. He also had a solid alibi for the day Marlena disappeared and was never charged in connection with her disappearance. Though months later, Summers would be arrested on an unrelated charge of fondling a nine-year-old boy in his backyard. Bailey recanted her confession shortly afterwards, stating she had made up the story because she was emotionally distressed, taking medication for depression, and had been psychologically coerced. I fell in myself. You're not making this up just because you're afraid? No, I fell in. Instead of implicating Summers as her accomplice, Bailey now claimed that he had sexually abused her as a child, and when he stopped by her house and she resisted his sexual advances, he retaliated by kidnapping Marlena. Bailey made several more conflicting statements about her daughter's disappearance. At one point, she said she had sold Marlena to pay off a drug debt. After she was charged with Marlena's murder, she was given a court-ordered psychological evaluation at a mental institution and they deemed her mentally fit to stand trial. The case went to a grand jury, but with no body or any other evidence against Pam, they decided not to indict her for Marlena's death and she remained free. In May of 1989, a report of child neglect was filed against a home in Anniston, Alabama in the months following Marlena's disappearance. The family that lived in the home had the surname Childress, but they weren't related to Marlena. Ten children were discovered in the home when a social worker visited, and one of them was a young girl that called herself Marlena Childress, but the adult strangely called her by a different name. The social worker later realized the girl resembled a missing girl in a flyer she had seen with the same name and the same silver-capped front teeth. When the social worker returned a day or two later, the family had already moved away. Two weeks later, they were located in Florida, but the girl was not with them. Neighbors also reported seeing her with the family, but the sightings were never confirmed. The family had a history of harboring other people's children. Once in Florida, the father was later arrested on sexually abusing two of his children. After Marlena's disappearance, Bailey quickly moved to Mayfield, Kentucky to live with her parents and had another son named Casey. On April 22, 2002, six days after the 15-year anniversary of Marlena's disappearance, Bailey told Casey, who was now 12 years old, that she had a surprise for him and he needed to be home at 7.30. She had him get into the car and drove him three miles to the Arnett Cemetery while he was blindfolded with a blue handkerchief. Pam would then lead Casey to a cemetery marker with the word son inscribed on it and had him sit down next to it. She then stabbed him three times in the neck and shoulder. Thankfully, Casey was able to escape to a nearby house where Russell Legions lived. Bailey then drove by the Legions' house a few times. Casey told Russell his mother tried to kill him and he didn't know why. Casey also said his mother told him he was partially responsible for her getting a divorce because of his attitude. 
Pamela and Casey's father, Johnny Bailey, were living together at the time of the incident, and no divorce papers had been filed. Pam was arrested hours later at a gas station in Nortonville, 70 miles away. Casey was released from the hospital the next day to the custody of his father. When Pam was arrested, she claimed that she completely blacked out and had no memory of stabbing her son. She was then charged with attempted murder, but ultimately wound up pleading no contest to second-degree assault. She received a 10-year prison sentence and has since been released. This incident prompted police to reopen the investigation into Marlena's disappearance, but she has still never been found. Bailey and Johnny did actually get divorced, but he still lobbied for his ex-wife's early release in 2004, claiming that Casey was no longer afraid of his mother and he would have had no problem having her around his children. Marlena has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Teresa Lynn Gibson, who went by the name Trini, was born to Robert and Hope Gibson. She lived with her family at 1427 Wittower Drive in Knoxville, Tennessee, and worked at a cafeteria in a local mall. She was very interested in plants, trees, and other living things, and hoped to later attend the University of Tennessee to study landscape architecture. In 1976, she was a 16-year-old student at Bearden High School in Knoxville. Mr. Wayne Dunlap informed the students they would be going on a surprise field trip on October 8, 1976. That morning, as her mother was dropping her off at school, she asked another student if the trip was still on or not because it was rainy, cold, and foggy. She was told yes, so she grabbed her bag to lunch and left her books and purse in the car. Mr. Dunlap did not tell them where they were going until nearly all 40 students were on the bus. Mr. Dunlap would be the only adult chaperone on the trip, and they began traveling over 50 miles to the Klingman's Dome in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The plan was for the students to spend the day hiking 1.8 miles along the Forney Ridge Trail to Andrews Bald Mountain. The students were excited about the field trip, and Trini shared a seat in the back of the bus with Robert Simpson. He was a senior and a close friend of her brother Bob, who had graduated the previous May and was in the Navy. Bob had just come home on leave and had asked Robert to keep an eye on her that day as she hadn't been away from her family for an entire day before. The bus arrived at the park around noon and parked in the Cleanman's Dome lot. Mr. Dunlap told them that they were to hike to Andrews Bald and be back at the bus at 3.30, observing the plants, trees, and flowers along the way. They were also told not to go further than Andrews Bald, take any side trails, and not to interfere with any of the plant life. The students had to raise their hands to confirm they understood everything and then they set off. At the start of the hike, the students separated into groups and Trini walked the trail alongside Robert. The students arrived at Andrews Bald at around 1.30 p.m. Trini and Robert ate lunch together before she asked to borrow his jacket. After eating lunch, Trini said that she wanted to start the hike back to the bus, but Robert told her that he wanted to stay at the vault a little longer and track a bear. At around 3 o'clock, Trini was hiking alongside another group of students a half mile from the parking lot. The other students stopped for a quick rest, but Trini wanted to keep going. As they stopped, they remembered seeing her walking alone in the distance before she bent down as if she was looking at something and took a right turn off the trail. The group turned their heads when another student walked towards them, but once they looked in the opposite direction again, Trini was gone. Once the students got to the spot where they last saw Trini, they noticed there was no visible side trail, but instead was thick shrubbery, ferns, rocks, and a small creek. She called Trini's name, but got no response. Assuming that she would be at the bus waiting for them, they carried on. When the students arrived back at the parking lot a half hour later, they noticed she was not there. Mr. Dunlap and another student spent some time hiking the trail she was last seen on while the other students waited on the bus. When they returned and determined that Trini was indeed missing, he contacted the National Park Service and filed a report at 4.30 p.m. Soon after, the bus left without Trini and Mr. Dunlap and headed back to Knoxville. Mr. Dunlap stayed behind to assist with the search. 
The school bus arrived later than originally scheduled, and when it did, school officials had to tell the Gibsons that their daughter was missing. They quickly headed to the Smoky Mountains to wait for news of their daughter. By 6.30 p.m., volunteers had gathered to begin looking for the missing student. The trail was popular with walkers, and her sudden disappearance was strange given that she had been with other people and there had been groups of students both in front of them and behind, as well as other hikers. Over the course of the next several days, a massive search was performed of the park by both ground and air, but she could not be found. Heavy rains, wind, and fog that night made conditions very difficult for searching. A partially opened can of beer and three cigarette butts were found near the spot where Trini stepped off the Forney Ridge Trail, but none of the other students admitted to having brought beer on the trip. A number of different search dogs would pick up Trini's scent at the spot where Forney Ridge Trail intersected with the Appalachian Trail. The search dogs tracked Trini's scent to the base of the Clingman's Dome Observation Tower and to the shoulder of a paved road 1.6 miles from the dome at Collins Gap. There is also a parking lot in this area. More cigarette butts of the same brand that was found in the woods were found on the shoulder of the paved road. Several sets of dogs all had the same conclusive results, as well as dogs brought in by Trini's uncles. With the fog in the area that afternoon, it would have been easy for her to have gotten lost after she stepped off the trail. However, the scent trail caused speculation that she may have been abducted, kept hidden at the Klingman's Dome Observation Tower until the other students left the area, and then led through the woods to the road by her abductor and driven away in a vehicle. The search lasted from October 8th until November 1st, 1976. Another search from April 18th to May 5th, 1977 found no trace of any remains in the park. The chief ranger told reporters he was almost certain she was not in the park. Searchers went back to the Klingman's Dome area in 1981, but again, nothing. Trini's family had suspicions about another student named Kelvin Bowman. Several months earlier, Kelvin had attempted to break into the Gibson home before Trini's mother shot him in the foot. He was ultimately sentenced to time in a correctional facility. When he was sentenced, he had made threats in the courtroom to harm Trini when he was released. From what the principal could determine, Kelvin Bowman was attending classes at Bearden the day Trini disappeared. He was released after only serving six months and was back attending Bearden High School at the time she went missing. Some students claimed they thought they saw Kelvin's car following the bus while it drove to the park, but Mr. Dunlap insisted there were no vehicles following the bus that morning. Kelvin would later be arrested in 1978 for raping a woman in her apartment and was convicted of third-degree criminal sexual conduct. Some suspicion was also directed towards Robert Simpson as multiple witnesses reported seeing Trini's comb, which she always carried in the right hip pocket of her jeans, on the dashboard of Robert's car following her disappearance. Her family said she never went anywhere without that comb and wouldn't have easily parted with it. He had been using it to comb his own hair, and once her brother Bob had seen it, he questioned him, and Robert told him that Trini had given him the comb to hold on to for her. Trini also had an expensive star sapphire pendant and a ring on when she disappeared, which were her Christmas and birthday presents. They were found in the possession of a girl at the high school. She could not satisfactorily explain how she came to have them. While Trini's parents were participating in the search effort for her, Robert stopped by the Gibson residence and made some odd remarks to Trini's sister about how if Kelvin Bowman had Trini, he'd kill her and that she may have run off with some horny hitchhiker. In spite of multiple searches of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, no trace of Trini has ever been found. Following her disappearance, her family sold their home and moved to a new neighborhood to not have so many now painful memories. But over time, the loss continued to take its toll and her parents divorced. Trini's older brother, Robert Jr., died in 2000 at the age of 42, and Robert Sr. died in 2004 at the age of 67. Her sister, Tina, died in 2016 at the age of 54. As of today, Trini has never been located, and this case remains unsolved. John Andrews Cheek was born August 3, 1965, to Irina and Richard Cheek. 
He was described as a social, meticulous, driven, and competitive person. He earned a bachelor's and master's degree in business administration. In 1993, at the age of 28, he was the chief financial officer for the Cates Company, one of Memphis, Tennessee's largest real estate companies. Cates managed 24 apartment complexes worth more than $100 million and was scheduled to go public in early December of 1993 as a real estate investment trust called Mid-America Apartment Communities Incorporated. For months, John was under a tremendous amount of pressure and had been working 18-hour days and traveling around the world meeting and working with investors. When the deal finalized, it would have pushed his salary up to $110,000 and given him $2 million in stock options, among other financial benefits, making him a millionaire. He had taken a three-day business trip to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Portland, Oregon, and Denver, Colorado to work out the deal, but it was unexpectedly delayed due to questions by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which affected him greatly, and so he took a late-night flight back to Memphis. It's unclear the details of what the problem was with the deal, but he returned almost despondent and very depressed, according to his colleagues. He told friends that he had not slept for three days when he arrived back to Memphis at 6 a.m. on December 1st, 1993. Instead of going home to sleep, he went straight to work and worked throughout the evening before leaving for dinner. About 11 p.m., one of his business associates dropped him off at the Crescent Center on Poplar and Ridgeway Streets in Memphis where his car was parked. He had just finished having dinner at the Cooker restaurant across the street and was intoxicated. On Thursday, the next day, John did not show up for work, and by Friday morning, his parents reported him missing. Saturday morning, his great 1987 Acura Legend was found abandoned on Interstate 55 near the Memphis-Arkansas Bridge on the Delaware exit ramp, now called the Metal Museum exit. The car was 12 miles away from his home, and his loved ones could not think of any reason why he would want to drive there. Investigators are not sure what happened to John. Authorities initially believed he took his own life by jumping into the Mississippi River, but an extensive search of the river did not reveal his body and his loved ones do not believe he would have committed suicide. His suitcases were found unpacked at the home he just bought at 6214 Heather Street in East Memphis and towels his mother had placed on his bed prior to his trip had been moved. The garage door, which he always kept shut, was left open. One theory is that he developed a mental disorder due to the stress of his job and may not recall his identity, but he had no known history of mental illness prior to his disappearance. His company did go national as planned, and an audit of the business found no evidence of wrongdoing on John's part, but because he was missing, he was never given the financial rewards he had earned. On February 14, 1994, a trucker named Ron Jackson walked into White's truck stop in Raffine, Virginia. He noticed a clean-shaven young man in a white shirt and tie watching television near the cash register. The next morning, Ron saw him again dozing in a chair. The young man had a change of clothing with him wrapped in a belt. Ron noticed that the man did not sound like he came from the streets and had claimed to be living in an Arkansas homeless shelter and traveling around with truckers and was on his way to Richmond. But Ron felt that there may have been something wrong with him mentally. Ron asked him to join him for breakfast, offering to cover the bill when the young man said he didn't have any money. After having breakfast, Ron left heading to his next stop in West Memphis, Arkansas, where he noticed John's missing persons flyer. Ron recognized John as the man he had met the previous day at a truck stop in Rafine, Virginia, 700 miles from John's hometown. John's family is certain that the man was John, but there is no way to be sure. The drifter had spoken perfect English and wore a pair of moccasins that were the same type that were missing from John's house. His family believes he could be suffering from stress-induced amnesia due to a mental breakdown. Some people wonder if it's possible for a man on the verge of becoming a millionaire to be begging for meals at a truck stop. Ray Sexton, a Memphis psychiatrist and longtime family friend, also suggested that John may have developed a form of amnesia due to the extreme stress he experienced at work. The medical term for this rare condition is a fugue state. 
Sexton explained that John was obsessed with a big project, and it is possible that this was so overwhelming to him that he blocked out his own identity. John had gone three months without getting a full night's sleep because he was so consumed with the project. But typically, fugue states only last minutes to days or months at the longest. It is unclear if John met with foul play, was in a fugue state, or jumped off the bridge, but as of today, this case remains unsolved. Sarah Ann McPherson was born April 17, 1977, to Gerald and Larry Gillespie. She was described as bubbly, caring, and always had a big smile. She grew up in Rupert, Idaho, and graduated from Minidoka High School in 1995. She then earned a degree from ITT in accounting two years later and worked many years at Dell Manufacturing. She met William McPherson in Boise, Idaho, and they married on October 31, 2001. They moved to William's hometown of Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and had two children, Jack and Rebecca. In 2012, at the age of 35, Sarah and her husband, who was known to be very controlling, separated and began living in different homes. Friends of Sarah's stated that she was afraid of him and wanted to get full custody of their children. However, on their 11th wedding anniversary, the couple took their children aged 7 and 11 trick-or-treating on Halloween. Hours later, around 1.15 a.m. on November 1st, a patrolman with the Mount Juliet Police Department noticed a car parked at a used store facility with its lights on. Upon inspection, he found Sarah deceased in the driver's seat of her car. She had been fatally shot, and police believe that it most likely happened sometime after 10 p.m. on Halloween night. Law enforcement did not believe her murder was random and believed she went to the facility to meet someone. Since her murder, William has not allowed Sarah's family to have any contact with their two children. Police told Sarah's parents that William moved him and the children into his parents' home in Mount Juliet and provided them with a phone number. But when they called the number, the person said they had the wrong number. Sadly, this is not the only tragedy the family had gone through. Several years before Sarah's death, her brother Matthew was killed in a car crash. Mount Juliet police have not named any suspects or persons of interest in the case. Sarah's stepson, James, says he cared a lot about his stepmom and actually moved to her hometown in Idaho before her murder because she had talked about how much she liked it there. He cut ties with his father as soon as he turned 18. This remains an active but cold case, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. <laughs> 